your hand. Okay. He used to be the regular, you know, the programmer for the program where we find people from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India taking part together. But in, in India, he is just different. So this is the difference I have noticed, you know. Yeah. They are all, they all are, you know, one community, one community. They talk to each other, they, you know, share the food, they prepare everything. But here, we fight each other. <laughs> <laughs> so, Professor Mehdi, let me introduce you to uh, Dr. Unnis sir. He is our advisor research. Uh, and now, Professor Dharmeshwar Dasar has also joined. Uh, he is the okay, chairman great. of the research. So we'll wait for some time for the others to join. Vice and Sir is also joining. Mm -hmm. good. We have 10 now. Yeah. It'll go up quickly. Yeah, <laughs> four minutes. When, when the peak time comes. Yeah, four, four minutes. And uh, night time is not a problem. As long as yeah. around this time, I have yeah, many, I many webinars I now. You so, so it is the, OK for me. Yeah. yeah but 3 o'clock at 3 in the yeah, morning is a difficult difficult do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you know, that's I've what seen, he, I've seen, you know, asked me see this Jadav Sharma from Jawahar, he worked on a Nobel already there and they woke up to even one o'clock and he was around 80 plus. He has got no problem at all. See, we the Indian, 10 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock means, you know, almost chapter is closed. <laughs> We should have that attitude, well, you know, no retirement. No, I don't think it's a question of attitude. I always think it's a question of what you're interested in. That you also it's, right. It's, it's not a question. I don't believe in the attitude. It's a question yeah. of if you are really interested in something, yeah, you can you'll continue. Yes. Stand. You are very That's right. sort of yes. If you are yes. not interested, you know, you'll fall asleep, you know. Yes. Yes. <laughs> or even me, you know, like watching a movie also, sometimes you can fall asleep. If you somehow don't get into it. So you stop. look at it very differently than the question of attitude, you know. Uh, of course, from one person to another, attitude could matter. But yes. in general, yes. I think um, interest is important. So. <laughs> I, I don't know if Borwa told you, I know him since he was a kid, so, you know, so his, his, his older brother is my classmate, so. Oh, very good. And very, very, very good friend, so. <laughs> Assam, which part of you, Gauhati proper or some Tejpur? No, I'm from Gauhati, so we, proper, uh, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Because I spent almost 40 years in Assam. Oh, really? Since oh, 1979. Hmm. My I, first entry was in 1975 for one week yeah. in Kitaba the, oh, for wow. my research purpose. Came back then 1979 in CSAR lab. Till I retired 2015. Again, continued in downtown university for about four and a half years. Fantastic. But still, I'm associated, you know, physically mm -hmm. not, but through online. <laughs> Well, you have, you have lived in Assam longer than yeah, I have. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My two <laughs> sons studied there only, even, you know, they speak Assamese so well, even now. Yeah. But for, for me, there is a problem. You speak anything, I can translate in English or Hindi. <laughs> but I cannot. That's the problem for me. Yeah. 40, 40 years. 79 to 2019, June. That's the reason, you know, each and every corner of Assam, I know very well. Not in Assam, even the Northeast. Live streaming this uh, later on YouTube. So there, you know, most of our students will be uh, joining the YouTube link.
చాలా బాయ్ సెన్స్ లెస్ సార్ యా the total time we have is 1 uh, hour so maybe if you can speak out 15 minutes then maybe you okay. can have time for question and answers sure okay but you are already getting slightly delayed 1 minute as per my watch so let yeah. us join in that's minute. that's okay i can adjust it so anyway <laughs> i'll give time for you but remind me with about let's say 5 minutes before to me so sure sir are you there hello sir hello yeah can yeah. you hear me yes sir we can hear you so uh, we are all ready if you give a permission we will yeah, please please go ahead immediately yeah please okay. so uh uh warm welcome to everyone uh, very good morning to all the participants and i'll say very good evening to our esteemed speaker professor dipmedi and uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce our speaker today for the chancellor's lecture series this is the 10th 10th lecture in the series and uh, this we must pleasure to introduce professor dipmedi who i know since i was a little kid so professor dimedi is kindly serving as a program director in the computer and network systems is called the cns division at the national science foundation nsf under the ipa program he is on leave as curator's distinguished professor in the department of computer science and electrical engineering at the university of missouri in kansas city usa he received his bsc in mathematics from uh, cotton college not university india msc in mathematics from st stephen's college university of delhi india and his phd in computer sciences from the university of wisconsin madison usa prior to joining the university of missouri kansas city in 1989 he was a member of the technical staff at at&t bell laboratories from 1987 to 1989 while at at&t bell lab he co-developed facility diverse routing a feature that was deployed in AT&T's, AT&T's nationwide dynamic routing network. He was the visiting professor at the Technical University of Denmark and University Perry, uh, Mary Curie, UPMC, now renamed as Sorbonne University in Paris, France. He was a visiting research fellow at Lund Institute of Technology in Sweden, a resource visitor at the University of Campinas, Brazil, under the Brazilian Science Mobility Program and served as a Fulbright Senior Specialist. His short-term visits include Princeton University, MIT, 
KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden and Conservatoire National des Arts at Metiers CNAM, that's in Paris, in France. He is an honorary professor in the Computer Science and Engineering Department at the Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. He was the editor in chief of Springer Journal of Network and Systems Management, and he's on the editorial board of IEEE ACM Transactions on Networking, IEEE Transaction Parallel and Distributed Computing, IEEE Transactions on Network and Service Management, IEEE Communications Surveys and Tutorials, Computer Networks from El Xavier, Telecommunication Systems from Springer, and IEEE Communications Magazine. He has served on the program committees of many conferences, such as IEEE ICNP, IEEE Infocom, IFIP Networking, where uh, he was included as TPC co-chair, and IEEE IFIP norms there also as TPC co-chair. His research has been funded by Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, and the National Science Foundation, NSF. He has published over 190 peer-reviewed papers, and is co-author of the books, Routing, Flow, and Capacity Design in Communication and Computer Networks, that was in 2004, and Network Routing, Algorithms, Protocols, and Architectures. The first edition came out in 2007. Uh, this is published by Morgan Kaufman and Elsevier, and the second edition was published in 2017. Professor Mehdi is a fellow of the Institute of Electric and Electronics Engineers, IEEE, and recognized for his scientific contributions to optimization and the design of computer communication networks. So I just uh, presented him very briefly, because if you have to keep talking about him, it will take a lot of time. Uh, but uh, we are really honored that uh, Professor Mehdi uh, has agreed to give us his available time and that to late of night there in the US. So I'll now hand over the stage to uh, Professor Deep Mehdi. So over to you, Professor Mehdi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Borwa. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here uh, to give this talk. And I, <clears throat> I promise that I'll have only one formula in the entire presentation and it will show up in the later part of my talk. Uh, let me share screen and we'll go from there. Here. Okay, can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, if I can switching the slides again works fine. Okay. It's okay. Good. Thank you. All right. So uh, let's get started and uh, you know. Um, it's so I kind of looked at a few things, especially because when I started working at National Science Foundation uh, a little over three years ago, <clears throat> I got stumbled into a set of problems that I was not uh, much aware of actually. And so, um, and that's in the context of uh, domain science application and huge data and to kind of connect it with uh, computer networking and systems research devices. So what I'll do is that I'm going to spend a few minutes first talking about a few uh, domain science applications. And so I've listed it there and then I'll talk about the uh, research opportunities and uh, things we have been working on. Not just me, the community has been working on to give a broader perspective. And I try, I'm trying to keep it fairly simple to be able to reach out to a broader you know, audience. So uh, feel free to, you know, uh, make note of any questions you have that uh, I will be then um, happy to ad address at the end of it. You know, so so I'm going to actually start with the the most exciting news that happened in the in the last eight to ten days. Actually, believe it or not, it's the discovery of eight stars. And I do not know how many of have you've seen the news in Assam. Uh, it's yes. actually Assam is your young woman. Lady, does. Lady. Yeah, she does. has been doing PhD at. Yes. Uh, uh, in That's Pune, right. and so she did uh, 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 is a lead author of a paper with her advisor Punam Chandra and a lot of uh, researchers from Germany as well as uh, US. Uh, and that uh, they did the discovery of eight actually what is called MRP stars, you know, and they used the GMRT uh, telescope, which is actually just near Pune. 
a very well-known place. And so the key thing was that where the work started was that it was they focused on sub gigahertz band at 16 megahertz and looked for rel relatively rapid rotators. And they basically stumbled on the right rotational phase to be able to figure it out. Uh, so uh, the one of the things, so I, I happened to get to know her uh, last few days, actually, I sent her an email to congratulate on her work. And uh, the, one of the reasons they were um, uh, focusing on rapidly uh, rapid rotators was because of the, the telescope time that was assigned to them. That means telescope is still a shared property. It's a giant one, but still there's time is limited different researchers want to do for different purposes, right? And so that's what uh, what is one thing they're limited by focusing on that. The, the important thing to note is that uh, in the last two decades, only seven such st stars have been discovered. So in that sense, this work is extremely significant of highly scientific value. So me being a uh, person and a data geek, basically, I sent her an email saying, how much data actually did you uh, process? And in fact, believe it or not, I got her response back just a few minutes before the talk started. She said she's uh, processed about uh, 1,000 gigabytes of data, which is one terabytes of data to be able to, to, to get into the results they try to look at. So this is actually a point about the data, why scientific experiment data is play, playing a much bigger role and an amount of data that's generated. So next example is actually from a couple of years ago, the black hole image. Many of you saw this picture that came out in April, 2019. And the image was actually um, created with the Event Horizon Telescope for Galaxy M87. And so that one, make sure that I have sense of the time, and it was uh, done with the Event Horizon Telescope. And so uh, it got, trans you know, the picture that was created was transmitted all over the world. The key thing about that uh, is that going back to the idea of telescope I just talked about, is that uh, that when you do the actual calculation to take a picture of a black hole that's so far away in um, billions of light years away, what you find out is that you need the size of a telescope that's as big as the diameter of the Earth. Obviously, that's impossible to build it, so what they did, they did an approximation. They used six different locations in the world where they use different uh, telescope. One, uh, you know, South Pole, there's one in South Chile, the one in uh, Spain, one in Mexico, uh, one in Arizona, one in Hawaii, like that. And you will notice that all of them are facing sort of one direction. And that's purposefully so, so that all of them can see where they're pointing to about at the same time to sort of trying to mimic. So you can think about this as a first level approximation that since I cannot build a telescope as giant as the size of the earth in diameters, we can approximate by doing it uh, by using a uh, telescope at different location. So data was actually collected, believe it or not, two years before that. It's a four days of clear weather. They, uh, they had to pick it up at all sites. They use atomic clock to GPS synchronize all the location so that the clocks are all synchronized. So me again, going to the data, when this uh, news came out, I was more very interested. And uh, Kelly Bauman, who become very famous, that's her picture with the, all the tapes. So they found out that the amount of data they collected with the VLBI, that is the telescope idea that is used, it, this actually happened to be five petabytes. So it's not gigabyte, not terabyte, we're getting to the five but this is, and then it took them two years to be able to analyze the data. So uh, I'll get, so change to a different example for a minute. It's called Ice Cube Detector. So Ice Cube Detector is to measure high energy neutrinos. Yeah, basically it helps to point back at where they come from so that telescope and satellites can look at them. And this is considered what is called as a part of the multi-messenger astrophysics. I know very little about it. I just happened to know uh, one of my friends, got to know somebody who has become a very good friend of my friend, Burkhardt, who uh, actually did this particular uh, work. Uh, so basically look at light neutrinos and the gravitational work. And uh, to, to basically, uh, they have this ice cube set up in the South Pole. 
and uh, to produce a model of how the Arctic ice responds to what is called a Chernikov light. And so uh, I put the note about what the Chernikov light, the Chernikov light it is, so that whether to produce whether neutrinos interact with the ice and to improve the reconstruction algorithm to finding the neutrinos. So they need to do a huge simulation to be able to do it. Uh, and the Frank's uh, ma'am uh, name I mentioned, he's a professor at UC San Diego. So this simulation was done in November, 2019, a very, uh, just two years ago, an event that went actually completely practically unnoticed, but it's actually extremely significant, not because of the result, because of the way they actually approach the problem to calculate it. What happened is that uh, you might have heard of a cloud, many of you have heard of, there are three big cloud provider, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, and Microsoft Azure. So the, uh, Frank actually used three cloud providers to, uh, to simulate this thing. So you wonder, you wonder why you need three cloud providers to use it. And this is actually just a graph from the simulation, how they ramp up the calculation and try to do it. The thing was that nobody has enough GPUs to calculate what he wanted to calculate. So initially they approached AWS. AWS says, we don't have enough GP for what you want to do. So then they partner with all three of them. And, and so they use all of the GPUs available in cloud services across the world, 28 different regions around the world. And it was orchestrated with something called HT Condor from University of Wisconsin. And believe it or not, this simulation created 20 terabytes of data. This was the first simulation the Frank and his team did, and they, uh, they did some more work after that. The important point here is more than the simulation, the amount of data. That's what I'm trying to focus on. They could not pull the data back from the cloud provider to do further analysis at their side. And that became a challenge. And that's where the network, to give you an example where the network becomes very important. By the way, just to kind of tell you, this is only two hours worth of the simulation they did on a Saturday morning when all the GPUs were free, they kind of set aside to be able to run it, spatial arrangement with all three providers. And National Science Foundation actually uh, funded this project and, and the one run of this 20,000, uh, sorry, two hour simulation cost about uh, close to 75, $80,000 US dollars to run it. But from our point of view, it was my colleague, Kevin Thompson, who actually uh, supported the project. Uh, he was the sponsor of the project. Our interest is to see what we can push the boundaries of uh, the computing. How far can we push it? What are the things we can learn and what not from it? Very, very important. So I'm shifting gear right now for, to something different, which is that whole slide imaging. This is from digital pathology. The Food and Drug Administration in the US recently approved that you can use digital pathology for telemedicine. Until then, you have to actually use microfilm and to be able to look at it. Uh, so the key thing is that what you find out is each image, WSI, actually size itself is five to six gigabytes. So if you look at my phone, for example, and if I take a picture with my phone right now, uh, it's only about five meg, maybe for a very high-end camera, maybe 15, 20 meg. My DSLR camera that I have, uh, but with a, a raw image that I uh, uh, used to collect data, it's about to take pictures, it's about 30 meg. So it gives you a perspective. The image here is a, the order, you know, multiple order of magnitudes higher when you go to five to six to, uh, gigabytes, right? So if you have one billion, you know, you have an amount of number of one million images, I mean, then if you calculate the numbers, you find out that you have to meet the one petabyte of storage. This is just one cancer center, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in, in New York City. That's the one petabyte of data. Now imagine that any pathologists want to access it from somewhere in the, in the country, forget the rest of the world, that they are not able to look at it and learn anything out of it. They have to transfer the, you know, physically transfer the data kind of a situation right now. So I will give you a last uh, couple of examples. COVID-19, you have all talked about it. I'll skip through a little bit. This uh, particular site, I said they have EKG data, X-ray data, PET scan, MRI, all this. It's in 18 petabytes of data they have for the, to, to, to create a comprehensive picture of the virus and its spread. And this 18 petabytes 
data that I learned for probably about six months back. It may be even bigger right now. So there, and then another large hadron collider. Uh, this is amount of data they generate is 10 petabytes per second of information generated. You know, that's very, you know, scientists around the world use that information. So this is where I say that we have moved to the world of huge data from a big data because uh, it's not just big data. So I gave the large the, the, a number of examples here. What I want to uh, tell you is that Anna National Science Foundation recently funded the design of the next generation event horizon telescope. It is in the planning stage. What we know is that it's going to generate 100 gigabits per second of data. That's what we know. And we need to be prepared for that down the road, like five to six years from now. Uh, let me give you another simple example, DNA. You know, every human being's DNA, if you calculate by looking at the base pair, just multiply it, you use it the eight bits to represent the four DNA base pairs and calculate it. You find out that the single human being's uh, uh, DNA, the full information can take 1.5 gigabytes of data. Now, if you use metadata and everything, I found out that it can vary from three gigabytes to 20 gigabytes. This is just one piece of information for one per person. By the way, there are some spaces which actually need more than that for a single a full DNA information than human beings actually. So uh, I can, last example, like the confocal and my multifocal microscope that's used for biometric, biomaterial research. There also images are 10 gigabytes. So we got interesting problems coming in that data size is becoming very big and everything. So it goes to what we call is a data intensive science. So fundamentally, if you look at science or engineering research, you look at theoretical science, you do experimental work or computational work. So data intensive side basically is that the science itself is generating massive amount of data due to the instruments that is used, whether it is a telescope or large hadron collider. And to, to be able to process it efficiently, to that can lead to new discovery and understanding and it goes to data intensive science. So now I, with that kind of a background I took, I'm going to then move to give you a few sample of how networking and system challenges comes in. So now think about the data, about the five petabytes of data I want to transfer from one site to another site. Uh, are our transfer protocol actually good? Do we have the computing environment? Do we have the network environment? How do you look at application, application layer data information and networking? And so I'm going to kind of touch on each of them a little bit, okay? So large data transfer, you could use actually, believe it or not, airplane. I mean, you may think I'm making joking that if you have a five petabytes of data, actually, believe it or not, right now, it is more efficient to actually put it on an airplane to transmit it because you get much data back. In fact, that's exactly what they did with uh, black hole imaging from the telescope uh, data, which was collected in Hawaii to Boston to MIT, where the, it was analyzed five petabytes of data they actually shipped it by airplane. It took them from packaging to flying and everything, somewhere in the range of about uh, 10, 12 hours, I think, to, uh, to transfer the data. And actually, it's very, very interesting calculation. If you do the calculation of that amount of time divide, uh, sorry, amount of uh, five petabytes of data divide by that amount of time, you get something like 16 gigabytes per second of data transfer. Uh, believe it or not, we do not have a network yet to be able to transfer. So network is now becoming the bottleneck, both from a kind of a, uh, a deploying a network also, as well as the transfer throughput that we needed. And that I'm gonna talk about in a second. So uh, I'm going to skip. So data transfer, uh, uh, those who do not know, you always use your uh, phone or laptop or desktop to transfer a web page. And it, it's governed by a protocol called TCP. It's called Transmission Control Protocol, if you're in a network, networking field. But we, uh, broadly, we call it a transport protocol. The important thing is it's governed by a, uh, what is called a bandwidth delay product. So let me explain what a bandwidth delay product is. It's actually, uh, this is the only formula I have in the entire presentation. It says that the maximum window size depends on the bandwidth or the data rate. 
plus the round trip delay. Okay, very simple. So if I then reverse it, that if I say that I want to look at the bandwidth, bandwidth is then what? Maximum window size and you divide by the round trip delay, right? So what does the maximum window size mean? So if you're not familiar with the term, what it means is that whenever there is a connection setup, let's say uh, you are going to receive data on your phone from a web service, your phone creates what is called a window that you, you don't see it, a window for the transport protocol. And this window is actually counted in terms of the bytes, how many bytes actually can uh, take it at a time. Because even though you have a, like say, one gigabyte file or 500 megabyte file, it doesn't mean he's going to open up that uh, big of a window to start. It. So if you look at it, that as the maximum window side and divide by the how much time it took from your phone to go to the server and come back, the round trip that you can get actually the so that this is going to be the highest data rate you can get. So let me show you a couple of example numbers here, why it matters, right? So let's say the window size, the first row here, you'll see it's a 0 0.66, 0 0.066, in, I'm showing it in megabytes. 0 0.6, 0 0.066 happens to be 64 kilobytes. And you may think, oh, 64 kilobytes is very simple, a very small window. It is because the TCP protocol that was designed 40 years back says that 16 bits of <laughs> uh, window size is going to be enough. So if you, you take 2 to the power 16, comes up to be 64 kilobytes or exact to be 65,536 bytes, right? Remember, we're using a 40, uh, 40 year protocol. Uh, that's what it was designed. So what happened if I set my laptop or what even a desktop where I'm going to collect the data to 64 kilobytes of window size, and let's say my latency is 100 millisecond, the maximum data rate I'm going to get from the bandwidth delay product formula I got is 0 0.005. So even if you have a link speed, say 100 gigabit per second, you are not going to be using even a small fraction of the link, even if you are the small only guy. Think about it like a, you are the driving on a extremely high speed uh, road, but your car cannot go more than 30 miles or 30 kilometers per hour. That's really what it is. you are the only person driving. So this is all limited by the window size. So what I did, I just to kind of uh, see what happens. I increased the window size just to understand the math of what happened to this formula all the way to 655 megabytes window size. And then if you have still keep the same latency of 100 millisecond, you can, you are going to get only about 52 mega gigabits per second. You are not going to even fill up the 100 gigabit uh, per second link fully. It's only, only 50% utilized. You are the only person that is using it. Now, what is important to think is that knowing that limitation of the original TCP window, there was a TCP scaling window that was activated. Uh, you have to activate for these big numbers and that can be done, but your laptop, you cannot set it up to 655 megabytes of window size at all currently. This is not possible at all. You don't have the memory to buffer management, everything to be able to do it. So you have to have a, a computer with a lot higher memory uh, to be able to do in memory processing and to be able to do it. And again, as I said, this is still limiting. So kind of stay with this story. I'm gonna now throw in uh, the file size. So if I throw in the file server of one gigabyte uh, uh, per second, so if you stayed with the original uh, TCP window, it is going to take you 25 minutes to transfer the file. Okay, so just that's one gigabyte. You go to 100 giga. So what I did was that you can see that I played with just increasing the window here the, instead of showing so many numbers with the high, TCP window size of 655 megabytes at 100 millisecond. You, it, I can actually transfer um, um, 100 gigabytes, even though I don't use the link fully, only 50%, a little over 50% utilized, I can actually uh, transfer the data in about uh, 0.25 minutes, okay? So that's a good, good, good thing about it, that I can actually do large amount of transfer. But first thing, you will need to have a large uh, link on a network to be able to do it. Secondly, you know, um, uh, 
you need to be able to play around with the window size. Okay, so that's that's the thing, or important thing here. So I want to then kind of uh, even go bigger file size, go went to petabyte with this high window use need, look at number of minutes it makes to transfer it. So it, it, you just realize that the problem, if we want to give the data access without you physically flying to where the data is, deciding to analyze the data, we have to make the networks workable. We have to make the machines, the computers that is needed to be able to have large window size, uh, you know, created to be able to do it. And by the way, there's been work in that space to create large window size uh, machines. These are called data transfer nodes. And many scientists, at least in the US, are already using it. And we're actually doing experimentation to really check that in practice, are we getting this thing or is there some other uh, hiccups have, uh, that we face so that we cannot actually get to the data. So, uh, so with that, I want to throw in a, <laughs> another trouble to the problem. The trouble to the problem is actually, uh, it's, a, it's a new factor I'm saying, but it was actually an old factor. It was not dominant before. This is called a checksum or CRC, cyclic redundancy code is used for checksum. So every time you, your data is transferred, data is actually, although you might have a window I talked about, window is not the size of the entire data size. It, uh, in the internet, it uses what we call as a packet. Packets are actually internet, most packets are maximum can be 1500 bytes. So if you have a 1500 bytes, bytes we want to make data integrity check because as, as soon as you go for a link, there can be a bit error rate. If there's a bit error rate, a, a, a one can turn it to turn out to be zero, zero can turn out to be one when you receive it because it's electrical pulse eventually, right? So if a pulse, if, a, if there's a shift in the pulse or whatever, or some noise in the pulse, you're suddenly realizing that you are getting wrong information. So very early on, this idea of a checksum was actually built into the protocol. So, so checksum basically says that every time a packet comes from one hop to the next hop, we're going to check it to make sure the data is actually integrity. If there is no integrity of the data in terms of that thing, I'm going to throw it out. Uh, the most important thing about the checksum based on CR CRC that to note about is actually probabilistic. It only can say that the probability of a data packet being corrupted, or rather we should get corrupted and unnoticed on the receiving side because it cannot recognize there was an error is actually very low, 10 to the power negative 13 or something like that, which was great for 40 years, right? So here's a couple of examples without going into any detail that some checksum are not cannot be detected is suppose reordering of two bytes of word, if I have 01020304, if I actually change that to 03040102, network cannot, so your CRC checksum cannot actually detect that, that this error actually ha happened. So I gave a few examples. So these are real example. Fortunately, this doesn't happen all the time. And so uh, that we, we get lucky in a sense. And so for some application, actually, it doesn't matter. So I'll come to that in a second. So, so if you have this thing, is that what's the likely have to have a checksum miss? Actually, believe it or not, there is a friend of mine, Craig Partridge, who did some work back in 1995 to look at that to estimate that he said that one in 16 million or one to one in 10 billion uh, segments can be corrupted and. Uh, and the TCP checksum that cannot be actually recognized by the transfer. So uh, what does it mean then? So I'm going to skip that. So remember the table I showed you? So he said that this depends on many other factors. He did some analysis of it, more detail. Then the staying with the probabilistic thing, you look at the network error type thing that happened. And he said that error can be between 100 those packets I talked about to 62,000 packets, depending on. So if you look, we're looking at a uh, 1,000 gigabyte uh, 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 file size, remember the one I talked about, Bernali Dust's paper, 1,000, let's say she wants to transfer it. There's a chance that the 62 packets, data packet about 1,500 byte packets, uh, sorry, I assume in this calculation, one kilobyte packet are going to be corrupted that, that she won't be able to actually recognize. 
Okay, and you go to a bigger file size, the corruption is going to be much, much higher. So we need a better way to be able to actually figure out this kind of thing. So is this a big problem? It actually depends on the field. If you think about a field, let's see where we are, okay. If you think about a field like say, uh, the high, um, uh, Large Hadron Collider, that data itself has a the chance of finding something, neutrinos, whatever it is they're looking for is the probabilistic also, very, very small. So, so for them, if there is some other probabilistic error, it doesn't actually matter, okay? That's one example for, for so let's say you are watching a movie over Netflix. So if a small amount of 1500 bytes get corrupted, you know, your uh, and network doesn't recognize it got corrupted, you're receiving TV or your phone where you're watching, you're not going to notice it because it's going to be just like a small blip. It's just going to go so fast. So it doesn't matter. Where does it matter? It may depart, matter for certain domain sciences, not all domain sciences. An important example is the DNA that I talked about. So DNA, remember I said you use a eight bits to do for the base pair coding and stuff like that. What happened if I'm transferring my DNA information to you and one bit got transferred? That's like a crossover and a mutation type thing that we talked about today, right? So if your data get corrupted like that, you, got, you have to find a way to be able to have the handle it. Now, there's something called grid FTP that is many people use at the application layer now to develop for scientific data transfer. That actually has added something on top of what TCP could do and to be able to at least catch it. Catching doesn't mean that they know how to solve it. They know there's an error, but they don't know where the error is. So that remains an open, interesting problem for network researchers to look at how do I find it and how do I actually Correct that information on the fly. So, so, so transfer thing just to give you a picture, a quick picture about how it is that. So you have to, you can do, you can think about. So, what happens if I compress the data? Will it be helpful? Your, your amount of data might be less, but the compressed data you might actually maybe be able to capture capture a CRC check than anything else because it's a binary data. And, but you won't know uh, where exactly it happened. You still face that problem. And also what I, when I looked at it, when you go to the information in terms of, uh, we're very familiar with compressing a file and sending it by email. But when you go to a um, one terabyte of data, you try to compress it, it's gonna take you a lot of time to actually taking compressing the data and to be able to transfer, transfer it. So it has a different problem and changes the problem dynamics there. So what I want to show you is slightly different concept here. What happened to able to do the data integrity program problem if we do what is called in the, you're a sender and there's a receiver in the core of the network, we build what is called the in-network computer and storage idea. And what it can do, it can actually look at, uh, instead of transferring all the data, let's say I break it into small, some bigger chunk. Let's say I have a, um, um, I don't know, the 10 terabytes or 10 gigabytes of data, I'm gonna break it into uh, one gigabyte of data at, uh, in terms of this large block. And I'm gonna do the data integrity check at uh, one block. Then you don't have to wait till all the way to the end because if the middle guy knows it, it can tell you back and say that you got an integrity problem on the first gigabyte. And if you can track it, you can say that, okay, your first gigabyte was fine. The second was a problem retransmit it so you can actually save a lot of time in the transmission and transfer time with, the, with all of this. Time. So uh, this again, I said it requires a lot of investigation. I'm going to I talk buffer management is a big important problem to look into. I'm going to skip this slide, you know, staging I talked about, but I'm going to let's next few minutes quickly talk about what's called the software defined networking. Quickly, uh, a technology that has come up in the, in the networking field in the, last 10 years. So basically what it says the software defined networking is that it's a software based controllers to direct traffic on a network, how you want to go, which path to take in the network to go from a uh, point A to point B. Okay, it's so like a source to destination. Uh, it changes the basic internet paradigm, but you can actually deploy it in a 
parts of the network to be able to do SDN and through a central controller, almost like directing the traffic. And um, uh, SDN has a lot of the different things that has happened in the last few hours called programmable networking and all of this stuff. You know, So I'm going to skip some of this detail, but just keep that in mind. We did some work a few years back with one of my PhD students, what is called the application layer networking for Hadoop MapReduce optimization. Hadoop is a, a big data platform to do batch processing of MapReduce job. We kind of look at it, say that what happens if we have a network and we use a software defined networking on those networks to be able to see how we can actually do it. We, what we found out is that Basically, when it does uh, the map reduce calculation in a network, you know those uh, orange nodes are where master and the slaves are located. They are actually going to transmit a lot of uh, what is called a reshuffle traffic through the network. And if we can optimize that amount of traffic in a network, we can actually reduce the compute time uh, significantly. And so, um, so that's the basic idea behind this thing of looking at the network with what is called the application layer information, we push it to the network to direct the traffic. Got it? Recently, another person has looked at data intensive side on application layer networking in this domain. So they look at read FTP, I talked about file transfer protocol, and there's an application layer for a software defined network with deep learning approaches to be able to really optimize how to transfer larger amount of data in a more efficient, shorter amount of time. By the way, these works do not take care of the Check some problem. Check some problem remains there. There, that needs to be independently addressed in research. So anyway, so large scientific data movement, software different networking is a very very ideal choice for that. There are now dedicated uh, research and education network RNE, uh, and the reason we use it is that the public internet is actually what I call the poor man's choice because they don't have enough bandwidth to be able to transfer what you want to do. Uh, it works for watching movies, and there's a reason why it works for movies because of the buffering concept and how they delay everything what you can watch. But if you want to transfer all of this kind of a data there, it doesn't work very well. So uh, we, we've been building a National Science Foundation and in partnership with other scientific organizations in different parts of the world. We have been building building RNA network. Um, but, you know, this is the only picture I had that I couldn't show it. What's in India, for example, connectivity. And then you can see how these things are connected from US to Europe, to South America, you know, uh, to, to Asia and whatnot to be able to do it. So this is actually RNA network that's actually being deployed with the software defined networking. So this, uh, I'm showing you one uh, important picture here, how the data transfer works with what is called the software defined exchanges that we use it uh, in different places in the, on the West Coast and the East Coast of the US and to be able to then connect it with other network that is operated by other government agencies and you know, or, or, or whoever they're funding it to run it for. So uh, uh, the one last important point here is that, uh, that something like telescope data or large hadron collider data is open. There's no secret in that information. This is raw data you can transfer. But what about bioinformatics data like DNA data? So if it is a DNA data, there has to be privacy issues need to be addressed. Who can see it? What can be, uh, who cannot see it? Who can you transmit to? So the policy concept comes into the picture. So it is not simply the data transfer. The policy aspect is important. And with that um, is that, uh, that there has been work on what is called the bio SDX, bioinformatics software defined network exchange. And Joe Membretti, who I know very well, has been working in this area to be able to see how we can actually uh, create a network architecture to be able to look at the service and the capabilities, what are the major technologies needed to be able to do this kind of work. So you can see where it is needed. And so finally, I want to talk about uh, the next minute or so on the digital pathology example I talked about. There, the problem is slightly different from a network point of view, because each image is five to six gigabytes. By the time you transfer five to gig, uh, 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 six gigabytes of information, you realize that it's actually not as useful. 
maybe at, at least spend 20 minutes or 30 minutes. It's too much of a time or for a scientist or a pathologist to be able to use it. I made a quickly note about that. It's not like video delivery. The, the reason it is not like video delivery like Netflix uh, that might use it. Netflix uses a different protocol called DASH, Dynamic Adaptive Streaming over uh, HTTP. What DASH basically does is that that's basically fakes you to say that they're giving you the, the movie in the real time, but they're not giving you to real time. They're delayed by almost can be 32 seconds to one minute long, depending on how much buffering they do and how encoding it is done. And so that's how you basically trade off the real time with uh, that kind of a delay to be able to provide a service like the video service on the internet right now. Even when you do not have a lot of bandwidth. But when you are doing an interactive thing like I am actually watching an image of a pathology image, WSI. That is a real time. I'm waiting there for the dancers to be able to see it. So it's an interactive process. So dash that is not is a not a good choice for that. So a simple idea here is that what happens is that instead of keeping just an image of uh, the say the highest resolution, what you do is that you can actually do multiple resolution for the same image so that you can actually then allow the end user to be able to, when they query an image, actually give a lowest resolution picture. Even if when they realize that, oh, this is of importance, they can actually then go up. So you can do some sort of application layer knowledge that you can incorporate into this uh, concept. And then, by the way, nothing has been deployed in this space at all. So this is why it is very interesting. There are a lot of interesting technical challenges there. I'm giving you a very high level view about how you might actually do it. So, um, uh, so that sort of kind of uh, uh, talk about that. And, and the last thing I want to say is that, I got a minute or so, I'm monitoring time, is that, uh, that if you kind of think about that, uh, what I said about our DNA, that if our DNA data is each person takes about uh, 3 to 20, 20 gigabytes of uh, DNA data with um, um, metadata information, and let's say um, we all agree, 100,000 of us agreed to do it. There are a lot of things comes into the picture that you cannot have all the data in one place for a variety of reasons, including regulatory reasons. So you have to think about a distributed way to look at the data. That's where I said that you have a cloud provider or whatever, data, the data storage provider might be different. And a network is going to connect all of them in you know, a very, very high speed network with new protocols developed for, so that the efficient way to be able to look at that. So anyway, we recently, uh, I'm gonna skip that slide for a second. We, uh, I recently funded a couple of projects to look at this sort of a distributed computing, how to efficiently do it. Pavin Rao is working on a democratizing genome sequence analysis project for me uh, because I am a network person, so I wanted to see what happened. And then um, Guru uh, Narasimha at Florida International University is looking at a molecular mimicry for the COVID-2 virus and how he can use a distributed computing platform to make it faster to kind of get an answer. So this is sort of my last slide. Um, we have been also, for, we just funded, in fact, this is a project I managed. A large um, uh, US state based on new network compute and storage. It's a next generation network test bed. And this one is, we're uh, doing international connectivity, we're going to be deployed in the next year or so. Uh, you can see it on the west code of the US connecting to Tokyo and Hawaii, Hawaii is always important for us because there's a telescope there on the East Coast all the way to CERN, Switzerland. That's important because of Large Hadron Collider. And the South, you can see Florida, we can go all the way to Chile because Chile is important. We got a telescope in there. We need to be able to move the data from there, right? So this is sort of a test bed. We're hoping that we can try out new experimental thing on a test bed like this so that we can be more production ready in the next few years when something like Event Horizon Telescope Next Generation is available or next uh, things they are trying to do with Large Hadron Collider, we're actually doing it. But to be able to get there, a lot of interesting problems that we have not thought about, or it's actually not even shows up on your um, 
commercial applications which are actually showing up in a scientific publication. So there are a lot of interesting opportunities there. So with that, I'm going to stop it here. I kind of covered the, with by starting by saying, um, giving an example, few examples from domain science application and kind of look at the network point of view at a very, very high level to just to give you a feel for what we need to do from a distributed computing point of view to be able to do um, for not just scientific prob problem, but I talk about digital pathology, the telemedicine problem and stuff like that, that we are not quite there yet. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop it here. Thank you so much, Professor Mehdi, for that very, very informative uh, lecture. Uh, many of us, in fact, all of us are so used to sending, you know, big volume of data here and without even realizing, you know, the intricacies involved in the whole process. Sometimes, sometimes we get upset uh, that, you know, things are not moving and, you know, oh, the network is slow. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, so the yeah, network is slow is actually a lot of factors. I talk about the window idea, right? Yes. It was, uh, you know, it, I still remember when our computer windows on the uh, 35 years back when I used to be 2000 bytes, you know, we were very happy you can transfer a small file. <laughs> and then, uh, newer laptops are, they, they have um, Microsoft upgrades the window, the basic, you know, the maximum window size and everything. But even with that, for large amount of things, it is still not there to be able to do it. And of course, the network link condition keeps changing, right? I only showed you a ideal condition of a link with 100 milliseconds of transfer time, right? Remember where that, uh, uh, the round trip time uh, appears, it's in the denominator. If it takes yes. longer, your throughput is going to go down. Right? It's a very simple calculation. So, yeah. uh, go ahead. Okay, now we are open to some questions. Uh, feel free to uh, just uh, uh, unmute you and ask the question to person ID. Uh, Professor Medhi, uh, uh, very scintillating uh, lecture and very encouraging that we actually do not know actually what way you are going to have uh, tackle the issue of this data storage and transfer, which is one of the biggest area of interest in the whole of the world. Uh, but I, I just wanted to know about uh, one factor that you have talked about DNA. Mm -hmm. DNA can store, a, store at, uh, at least 1.28 uh, petabytes of data in, uh, in one gram of DNA. So if this happens, if DNA can be a better storage facility uh, for the data that we generate in different forms, uh, what will be the mechanism of transfer of this data from DNA to our use? That's one thing, I just uh, my query. And uh, what may be the future of this particular segment? DNA is a data storage candidate in whole of the world. Because I myself, from a uh, man of genetics, I just wanted to, I'm interested in that area. Of so course. these are the two, two queries in yeah. uh, my case. Uh, uh, Thank you, Professor Das. Uh, let me try to answer it and say if I miss something, let me know. Uh, the thing is that, um, as I said, the uh, one human genome sequence is in the gigabyte range. And if you have a hundred thousand of them are donated, you get, so the, we got a huge situation with not having a good way to understand first where to store the DNA, how much storage is needed. Second thing, forget everything. And just from a scientific point of view, you want to analyze the DNA. You have to have a distributed, very high speed network because not everybody can go to go to a site and look at the data. It's just scientifically, that's a very costly endeavor in that sense. So what we can do is that, that this, remember I talk about the research and education networks. The research and education network are extremely important. This is where science policy in a country really matters because science policy only, they can say that we need to get it because 
So the scientists can look at the data. You might have a way to analyze the data nobody else has thought, thought about, right? It's absolutely possible sitting, you know, in Guwahati. You know, I won't be surprised. So, and you want to be able, if you cannot access the data, you can actually, you are not being able to do what you think you can do it. So this is what we, uh, in, we use the term called um, democrat, democratizing the access. So the storage, and how we network it with like research and education network to connect all of this to be it's still like a uh, open problem quite fully how to actually do it it's still not clear because i at national science foundation i heavily look into the storage and network problem to, 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 for the future the strategic planning point of view what do we need to do to be able to be able to give better because my thing is that I'm, you know, to borrow a term from chemistry, I'm a catalyst that if I can make my network better, the scientists are going to do find new discoveries and that may help, you know, to improve the situation in the world, right? So that's, that's my motivation. Uh, but I do not honestly have a good answer to your question. <laughs> Let me put it that way. But it's, a, it's very, very important. So that's why we look into this problem and the network problem and the, to put problem and everything. Professor Meiji, thank you very much for your very excellent presentation. But I have something totally different, not okay. from anything related to the science. I don't know whether you have or you have made any attempt on that. You know that Assam Association of North America, have you heard any that? Assam yeah, I, yeah, I know that. Yes, okay. of course. Now, during that 2017, when Amar Choudhury was the Vice Chancellor of Assam Downtown University, our university took up a very challenging job. You know, it is something very much needed for the people of Assam. You know, the, the present generation, the young kids, is born and brought up in the US when they come back to India, it's become very difficult for them to convince or to talk to their grandparents because they can't speak English. And these boys or girls, they speak in, uh, you know, very, uh, you can say, very difficult language in English, and they have to, they wanted to convince. So we took up a project that is on Android-based app, where mm -hmm. talking and writing with simple words. You know, it was a mini project given by the Assam Association of North America. And we come up with some for the Gauhati airport when they go to the Kajiranga, how he approached the local people. So small, right. small sentences, you know, you know, Amar Chaudhary very well. So yeah, we yeah, also I took, I know. you know, I was there, so we took it, we had an MOU with Assam Association, it was a very little amount. And some of the very, very preliminary things they developed, one of the computer students of our university, and we have got a uh, copyright registration also we got. But we could not progress further, even now. Awesome. If you wanted to translate, see any language in Google, you can get, but SM is not possible. Now, is it possible or have you heard anything like this or anybody has suggested like, because I found to be, this is something a very serious, because I understand, because when my son returned from US, he was he was in a Mexican type, the way of talking and his grand angle could not understand what you are, and they wanted to talk to each other. But right. same thing in other, but have you done or do you come across anything like that or is it possible? Uh, uh, it's definitely possible. It's a, uh, I, I don't think it is, I mean, it's, a, it's a still a challenge, but it's going to happen in the next few years. Because what happened is that, that's where the network matters too, first yeah. thing, because if your network connectivity is good, what happens is that you don't have to store everything on your phone. You can go to yes. the cloud, compute it, and give the translate right there. It is okay. already possible right now okay. to be able to. Google has a now a phone service okay. where that if let's say you are you are uh, you cannot you are deaf you cannot hear. I talk is going to on your side is going to prompt it what I talk in a type form. And so you can then listen and you can respond back to me, even though you didn't hear any of the words. 
Okay. So, and what do they do? This is not that the phone is doing. They send all the data to the okay, large compute right. problem yeah, at yeah, the yeah. cloud, yeah. compute it and push it back to you. Yeah. So it is absolutely possible. It's, 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 it's a question of somebody interested in developing it and deploying it. So it's definitely possible. See, I wanted to have it like that. You know, suppose somebody, a Russian, or France people, Japanese, they're very particular about the language. When they come and talk, they give a seminar, they speak their language. But you know, you, we, we all were provided the airport and we automatically translate, we get it in our own mother, maybe possibly in English. Yeah. The same thing what I wanted. Suppose, you know, you provide a, you know, this was a mobile based app we developed it's a very primary state where you can exchange the old right. people and the empty people so with mobile you can still do a small storage and do some of the basic yes. phrase and yeah. thing obviously is it possible so to come in the cloud yeah. yeah so let me try to answer a question that was in the chat message uh, yes. the question is that how can we justify scope of attendability of any big data project uh Justification, I am not sure in what context you are asking the question, uh, but um, it is obviously possible to patent an idea. Obviously, it is allowed, whether it is scientific or technological problem. So um, uh, if you're asking in the justification in the context of a, um, a benefit to the society, uh, that's up to you, you know. I have never done any patent. It's just my, I, as a personally, my philosophy is that I don't do any patents, but I am not going to stop you from submitting a patent and, uh, you know, uh, patenting your idea. So, um, so I don't have a problem with that. Uh, people have uh, patented uh, optical fiber technology and got Nobel Prize as well. So it is possible to, you know, uh, patent an idea that uh, related to something maybe you can patent an idea about how to process large amount of uh, data you know obviously it is possible you know so um it's you know i i don't see that i don't want to go into the question of justification in that sense but you know it's a it's a if the the, the policy of the government in terms of submitting a patent allows you to do it so you could do it you know so so I, that's the only question I see, Sunandan. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, maybe uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, would uh, like to make a comment. Sir, are you there? Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your your uh, this connection, I think, is unstable now. Maybe the Dr. Deep Medi, when you was talking. All the internet yeah. things, they were afraid. So they are all giving good service. <laughs> okay, yes, it is right. becoming a little <laughs> unstable. Uh, I, I thought uh, like it was a very exciting talk and for like uh, me, me as a layman, uh, like like while attending this uh, digital workshop, digital meeting. So quite often you get irritated. Somebody say bandwidth a problem suits of your video suits of the. So I think we got a lot of one, like uh, basics that it is required. No, we don't know the engineering of, of uh, engineering of our Quran, but it's good to know some basics. I just thought, uh, like when you said your window size uh, and then um, if it is not announced, then you cannot get more data kind of thing. It's similar a situation when you have par liter of diesel, you need to go faster to save diesel, <laughs> to save money. So can, like what kind of research you do and the same amount of window size, we get more information. Like uh, what, is, what is the direction of research on that? Excellent question, uh, uh, Professor Talibzar. You know, in fact, uh, there's been a lot of research work that has been done in the last 30 years that if your window is fixed, can we push something more? That's where the error in the network matters, right? So if there's a more error in the network, what we know is that because of the latency that I talked about, which is in the denominator, your throughput is going to go down. You're not going to be able to. So what you do is that you uh, do a um, lot of additional coding with the transfer of the data or try to actually uh, do some amount of error correction so that your throughput you can maintain at a higher level. Now, having said that, not all of those research that has been done in that space has made it into a product. 
for example, or you know, your laptop or phone, you know, because that's controlled by the the vendor who makes it or whatever, right? They try to follow the technology, but not all of those ideas go go there. But people have done a lot of research in that. Uh, There's that a room area. there. There's a space there to absolutely do more for common people to get a better service and smaller price kind of. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. There's room. Thank you. Room definitely there. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. I see another Excellent. question. Thank you very much. Do you have another question? Otherwise, I'll go to. Uh, one more in the chat box yeah so next time like uh, the, before like i am going to go uh, next time you visit us some uh, please do visit us so uh, like sure, uh, i will uh, we'll make okay. it a point like uh, we'll invite you physically okay. if you can also deliver a talk it will be very nice there will be many students many students may not have attended too many of all these uh, faculty members so it will be nice if you can also we can also have an opportunity of your talk for the students Absolutely. thank you thank, thank you. you very it much my pleasure Thank you so much for joining. So let me go to the, um, sorry, is Li-Fi technology going to solve many of the problems that are observed in this current big data transfer? I, 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 I don't want to guess it. I suspect that it's not going to um, uh, solve all of the problems, I think, because remember, it is not the technology is not just the problem. Technology is just uh, one aspect of it, Techno but the other aspect to um, um, other aspect to keep in mind is that that the uh, the transfer protocols have window size and everything. So those things are also plays into the the picture. And so when I talk about remember with the window size, you cannot use the window size for a very large amount of data transfer on a simple laptop. So you got to then have um, larger memory on a computer that's going to transfer it. And then when you go to the larger memory, the buffer management in the memory so that the window doesn't get locked up, those needs to also, you know, be, uh, has to be actually addressed. So sorry, I was trying to look up something for you to, to see if I can. So, uh, so that sort of thing tells you that that you know a uh, lot of thing needs to happen we always focus on the technology but the science behind the technology is very very important to 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 to, to go to be able to do um, better transference uh, you know uh, to, uh, to possibilities so. uh, and uh, by the way in general i i don't believe wireless is a good technology for Big data. Uh, the reason is that wireless has their inherent uh, error because anytime you go over the air, you're going to co cause error. So there are things that has been done um, uh, for short distance to be able to take care of uh, retransmitting within the uh, to, to, to take care of the errors and stuff like that. But eventually, for very, very large amount of data, you have to rely on fiber optics. Fiber optics is the most reliable technology for that purpose. So um, wireless wireless is uh, nowhere going to be close to uh, fiber optics, uh, even in my lifetime, I think. So, <laughs> so yeah. OK. So uh, you know, in the Ice Cube example that you gave, 50,000 uh, GPUs in 28 different mm -hmm. locations, you know? Uh, honestly, when you really think about uh, the synchronism of these, you know, it is a matter of wonder. And uh, uh, from what you were saying, it appears that the uh, transmission errors are also coming down uh, with time. So uh, how far are we exactly when you can say, no, we can actually transmit 100% uh, uh, error-free huge data? Uh, is it really possible? Yeah, I uh, hundred. So uh, I want to tell you the 28 regions in the world, they are all connected by fiber optic networks. They're, there's no wireless at all anywhere. I want to make that clear first. So fiber optic networks allows a very high reliability <laughs> that, that is connected between different sites. That's why it is possible that it is. Secondly, uh, for that simulation, some amount of small error is not as a critical thing. It's not like a DNA data. That's what I said. Yeah, so yeah. depending on one domain science to another. So if Frank would find, you know, had some 
issue with the some small error in the packet, some data, it is within the, the other statistical errors they can take into account in their scientific domain, right? So they're going to be okay with it. But I want to make it clear that if we didn't have fiber optic in the world today, nothing will work, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> nothing will work. Fiber optics is the, you know, the, the, the savior in the world right now, believe it or not. It's a technology. I'm glad somebody got a Nobel Prize for it, you know, <laughs> yeah, so to be able to answer it. So only when you think about the wireless, you, you have to realize that wireless is only the last mile. So if you are going from your, let's say your home or uh, on the road with your cellular phone, trying to access the Google, so you are doing a Google search, only that one mile or half a mile or 200 meters is actually wireless. Everything else is on the wired network. Wide network inherently has a better uh, bit error rate, you know, problem. So the less bit errors and stuff like that. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we have yeah. to keep that uh, in mind. Thank you so much. And uh, since no more questions there, oh, uh, there's one more. I just saw a question. I think. I okay. think it's Dr. Oni. Uh, okay, so that's Dr. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Oni <laughs> made a statement. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, then uh, I'd like to uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mehdi, for giving us a value of that. To, I think it's close to midnight there now. It must be past midnight. Uh, it, it's okay. It's a Friday night. It's not a problem for me. Okay. So timing is okay. I, I, I'm a late night person. You will listen. Yeah, so. Same like me. You know? <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much and for thank this uh, very informative lecture. And I'd also thank all the participants who are here. Uh, just for your information, we had close to 101 people here in the Google Wing. And in YouTube, nice. there were about another 100 people there. So close to about 200 people attended this. And uh, I'll definitely take uh, feedback from them and pass on to you. And thank you so much for giving your time. And we look forward to many more such interactions in the future. And like our Honorable Vice Chancellor said, when you're visiting Guwahati next, please make it a point to visit our university once. We'd love to have you on campus. Thank you so much and uh, have a great, good night, sleep there. It's cool, I guess, now in your part. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed giving the presentation and the question. Uh, so, and, uh, and so I, you know, uh, I enjoyed giving talks, you know, uh, that's the, you know, easiest thing for me to do as, as a professor. <laughs> and and uh, when I'm uh, next time in Guwahati, I'll definitely Please visit the yeah. point to be able to um, uh, visit ADTU. Okay. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank sure. you.